Welcome to Sacred Rhythms, a curriculum that will introduce you to spiritual practices that God can use to nourish your soul and transform your life. Spiritual transformation is the process of becoming like Christ for the glory of God, for the abundance of our own lives, and for the sake of others. The possibility that we can grow and change is one of the most exciting promises of the gospel. It is the promise that we do not have to stay stuck in our sins and negative patterns, but that we can be changed in the deep inside places of our hearts and lives. We can become people who are able to love God and love others more fully, which is the greatest evidence that God is at work in our lives. The habits and patterns that open us to the transforming work of God are sometimes called spiritual disciplines. These are not simply a list of things to do. They are a way of life, and in Christian tradition there's a name for the kind of structure that supports us in our growing. It's called a rule of life. The idea of a rule of life originated with spiritual leaders like St. Augustine, St. Benedict, and Teresa of Avila. These spiritual leaders crafted a way of life as a guide for monks and nuns who were living together in community. It was simply a way of ordering their days, their regular routine schedule around spiritual disciplines that could help them to stay open to God. Another way of talking about a rule of life is to use the language of spiritual rhythms or sacred rhythms. This language draws on the imagery of the natural rhythms found in the created order the ebb and the flow of the ocean waves and tides, the changing of the seasons, the sunrise and the sunset, the rhythms experienced in music and dancing. This curriculum is designed to help you cultivate your own sacred rhythms, a regular rhythm of practices that are set apart for a sacred and holy purpose. To do this, we will first pay attention to desire so that you're in touch with what you want to order your life for. Then we will experience some of the key disciplines that you can eventually put together in a rhythm that works for you. The key word here is experience. We will learn about the disciplines, yes, but even more importantly, we will experience them together. Each session will include teaching and discussion about a particular discipline and then I will guide you in actually experiencing that discipline. Although some of the experiences might feel a little different than anything you've done before, and you might even feel a little awkward at first, I'm asking you to at least try each of the disciplines as we experience them together, just to see if they fit for you. You have nothing to lose and a whole lot to gain. So as we begin this journey together, it's helpful to know that these disciplines are ones that spiritual seekers down through the centuries have practiced in order to keep themselves open to the transforming presence of God. My hope and prayer is that as you explore these disciplines, you too will experience God's transforming presence. When was the last time you felt, really felt, your own longing? Your longing for God? Your longing for love? Your longing for a way of life that works? When was the last time you felt a longing for real change and transformation in the stuck places of your life? This may feel like an odd question to begin with, and it might even feel a little uncomfortable, but don't rush past it. This may be one of the most important questions you ever ask, because when we pay attention to our desire, we are tapping into the most powerful dynamic of the spiritual life, our desire for God and God's desire for us. The stirring of spiritual desire indicates that God's spirit is already at work, drawing us to himself. We love God because he first loved us. We long for God because he first longed for us. We reach out for God because He first reached for us. In the spiritual life, everything originates with God. And as it turns out, the spiritual life begins in this most unlikely place. Like the rhythms found in nature, the rhythm of the waves and the tides, the rhythm of the seasons, the rhythm of a good beat, 
we can discover rhythms that are so good for body and soul that we don't want to live without them. Like the rhythm of a beating heart or our steady breathing, rhythms that are so necessary to our physical life, there are spiritual rhythms that are necessary for keeping us alive spiritually. But it all begins with paying attention to the spiritual desires God has placed within us. You know, it's interesting how our spiritual desire can ambush us at the strangest times. Maybe you've seen a movie recently where you connected with the character and maybe that character experienced some level of change or transformation in their life. Maybe they found a great meaning for their life or they acted in a way that had great integrity or maybe they found a great love. And as the movie winds down and the credits roll and the music swells, you sit there and you're in touch with your own longing to experience something like what that character experienced. Or maybe you're in a season of busyness. It could be busyness at work. It could be busyness in your family or even busyness doing things for God, good things for God. And yet you notice underneath it all in a quiet moment that you're longing for God, that it's been a long time since you and God have been intimate with each other, that it's been a long time since you've experienced something for yourself in the deep inside places of your own soul. It can be uncomfortable to be in touch with our longing. And in fact, I think some people actually keep themselves busy so they don't have to be in touch with the deeper longings of their hearts. But the truth is that when Jesus engaged people in conversation about taking new steps in the spiritual life, he would often ask them questions that would help them to get in touch with their spiritual desire. He would ask some version of the question, what is it you want? What is it you seek? And it's an interesting question, isn't it? It takes us beyond all the ways we normally define ourselves outwardly to a much truer place, a place inside that is tender and vulnerable, where we know that what most needs to be done in our lives, that thing that we most desperately want, only God can do it. Being in touch with our spiritual desire may not be very comfortable, but it is an important place for us to be in the spiritual life because it takes us to a place of honesty and openness that creates space for God to come in and to do what needs to be done in our lives. One of the most powerful stories about the role of desire in the spiritual life is the story of Bartimaeus from Mark 10. Bartimaeus was a blind man who had been sitting by the Jericho Road for years begging. This was a way of life he had created around his impediment. And on this particular day, somehow he knows that Jesus is going to be passing by and this creates within him a sense of spiritual possibility. He knew that Jesus was a person who might be able to do for him something that he had not been able to do for himself and that no one else had been able to do for him. But he had a bit of a problem. You see, Jesus was a very popular person and he was always surrounded by those disciples and by other interested parties. And the intersection where Bartimaeus did his begging was noisy and crowded. And he wondered, how in the world am I going to get Jesus' attention? So you know what he did? He reached way down deep inside of himself. He got in touch with his deepest need and desire. And he cried out to Jesus from that place. He said, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then a really interesting thing happened. The crowd got uncomfortable and they tried to silence Bartimaeus. And I'm not sure exactly why they tried to silence him, but I have an idea or two. I wonder if, first of all, it was because they were not used to someone crying out from such a human, vulnerable, raw place. I also wonder if they weren't a little bit jealous and they thought, well, why didn't I think of that? I have something I'd like Jesus to do for me. Why didn't I think to cry out to Jesus? So whatever it was, discomfort, jealousy, they tried to silence Bartimaeus and to keep him from crying out to Jesus. 
But Bartimaeus was so clear on what he wanted that he just reached even deeper inside of himself and he cried out even louder and he said, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus was completely arrested by his cry. He stopped right there in the middle of the road and he told his disciples, tell that man to come here. And so the disciples came running over to Bartimaeus and they said to him, take heart, he is calling you. And Bartimaeus was ready. In fact, the scriptures tell us that he threw off his cloak, he sprang up from his place by the side of the road and he ran to Jesus. You know, it's possible that Bartimaeus' cloak was the only thing of value that he owned. And it's almost certain that he wore that cloak tightly and that he had pockets and seams within that cloak where he kept the money that he had collected throughout the day. Some commentators wonder if his robe was his only outer garment so that throwing off his cloak, he was not only throwing off everything he had that was of value, but he was also willing to let go of his dignity in order to come to Jesus with nothing but himself, open, vulnerable, and receptive in Jesus' presence. And Bartimaeus' vulnerability brings us to the pivotal moment in the story, that moment when Jesus and Bartimaeus are face to face with each other in the middle of that Jericho road, and Jesus asks Bartimaeus that all important question, what is it you want me to do for you? Now, if I'd been Bartimaeus, I might've been a little uncomfortable at that point. I might have thought, well, don't you know the answer to that? Isn't it kind of obvious I'm sitting by the side of the road begging? Isn't it obvious what I need? I might not have wanted to say it out loud either in such a public place because it feels like a personal question, right? I might have wanted to say to Jesus, could we go somewhere else and talk about this because this feels really personal. I don't want to do this here. But of course, Jesus did already know what Bartimaeus needed. But I think what Jesus also knew was that Bartimaeus needed to talk out loud to someone who could make a difference. He needed to say it to Jesus. And Bartimaeus was ready with an answer. He didn't hesitate. He said, my teacher, I want to see. And it was Bartimaeus' willingness to name his desire and to be with Jesus in the middle of that desire that actually opened up a space where Jesus could be with him in a healing way. And so Jesus says to Bartimaeus, your faith has made you well. But the story doesn't end there. The very last sentence of the story is the most encouraging phrase of all. Not only did Bartimaeus receive his sight, but it says that he got up and he followed Jesus on the way. Because you see, Bartimaeus didn't have any other way of life except the life of a beggar. He had framed his whole existence around the fact that he was blind and now that life didn't work for him anymore. Because he had encountered the healing presence of Jesus, he needed a new life that was framed around being healthy and whole, but that was not a life he was familiar with. He didn't know how to live as a seeing person and he realized that following Jesus would be his way to a new life. And so we see in this story that the willingness to name our desire in Jesus' presence not only opens us up to the fulfillment of our deepest longing, but it's actually the entry point to a new way of life in Christ. It opens up the possibility of following Jesus in a whole new way. The purpose of the guided experiences is to practice. The guided experiences give us an opportunity to practice disciplines that we might be unfamiliar with, and yet they are very concrete ways of opening to the presence of God. In this first session, we want to practice a guided meditation on scripture. Now that we've heard the story of Bartimaeus and received some insight as to what was happening in that story, now I want to give you an opportunity to find yourself in this biblical story. 
So first of all, let me encourage you to find a comfortable position in your body. If you're sitting in a chair or on a couch, you might want to uncross your legs and place them flat on the floor as a way of being open and alert in God's presence. Some people find it helpful to actually open their hands on their laps as a way of expressing with their bodies that they are open and available to God in this moment for what it is that God wants to give. It can also be helpful if you'd like to close your eyes because when we close our eyes we can block out some of the surface distractions so that we can be deeply attentive to the presence of God within. You might also want to breathe deeply and actually pay attention to your breathing for a moment because our breath is a gift from God. Our breath is something that God is doing in us and for us in this very moment. He is giving us each and every breath we take and with our breath He is affirming our life. So go ahead and breathe deeply as a way of releasing tension, as a way of opening up the inner space, as a way of coming in touch with the Holy Spirit of God, who is the breath of God, that Holy Spirit who is closer to us than our breath. So as we begin and as we're settled into that comfortable position and we're breathing and we're expressing even with our hands and our body position that we're open and available to God, I invite you to imagine yourself in the Bartimaeus story. Imagine yourself on that dusty road in that noisy, crowded intersection where Jesus is about to pass by. And like Bartimaeus, come in touch with that desire in your own heart, what it is that you're longing for today, what it is that you have hopes for, that you think perhaps Jesus could meet you and do something for you that no one else has been able to do. Imagine yourself there on that busy, crowded, dusty road in touch with your own longing and desire. And I will read the scripture to you, stopping along the way so that you can reflect on some of the different places in the story. But the encouragement here is for you to let yourself be in this story and for you to have an encounter with Jesus, just like Bartimaeus encountered Jesus that day. So are you ready? Let's begin. Jesus and his disciples came to Jericho, and as he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. So are you experiencing yourself there on the road, in touch with what it is that you most need and want? When Bartimaeus heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and to say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Can you imagine yourself crying out to Jesus from that place of your own deep need? Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Can you hear the voices within your own heart that try to silence you? Who are those voices? And as you hear those voices trying to silence you, can you reach down to a deeper place within you and cry out to Jesus just like Bartimaeus did? Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and he came to Jesus. What is it that you need to throw off in order to be free to run to Jesus?
Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? And can you imagine yourself in the middle of that busy road, face to face now with Jesus? And Jesus is asking you the question, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. And immediately he regained his sight and followed Jesus on the way. And so as we're sitting quietly in these moments together, as you have spoken about your true desire to Jesus. Can you sense his invitation to follow him in some brand new way? Amen. When we're in touch with our deepest longings, a whole different set of choices opens up for us. The choice to arrange our lives in ways that are consistent with what we say we want. Our longing for love, our need for deep and fundamental change, our desire for a way of life that works, our longing to experience God and to be transformed in God's presence. Becoming more aware of these inner dynamics can lead us to search out spiritual practices and to establish life rhythms that promise something more. But it's not until we have settled into our desires and named them in God's presence that we're ready to be guided into the spiritual practices that will open us to receive what our hearts are longing for. These practices nourish the soul and they keep us open and available to God's transforming presence. So after we learn some of the basic disciplines, there is infinite creativity for putting them together in a way that works for us, and great freedom for adding other disciplines and creative elements as the Holy Spirit leads.